Good morning. This is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. Welcome to the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. Today we're studying in the book of Numbers, chapter 6. Are you called to be a Nazarite? Are you called, for instance, to be single for Jesus? Or are you called to have a vow of poverty? In this chapter, God instructs the people regarding the vow of the Nazarite. And many extrapolate that and apply it to their idea of being single for Jesus or being celibate or having a vow of poverty over their life. Is celibacy scriptural or is it a curse that has to be broken over your life by the God who said it is not good to be alone? Nazarites were required to live in abstinence, abstinence from wine, not to cut their hair, not to come near the dead. Every one of those things were very much in Jesus' mind in many of his teachings, and we have a spiritual application to make, as the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of the New. There is New Testament truth for us in this chapter as we consider it. Numbers. Chapter 6, let's begin reading. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say to them, When either a man or a woman shall separate themselves to vow the vow of a Nazarite, or to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar or wine, of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of the grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried grapes. All of the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in which he separates himself to the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of his hair grow during the days of his vow. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he will not come near any dead body. He will not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother or his brother or sister when they die because of the consecration of God upon his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy to the Lord. And if any man die suddenly by him, and he hath defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing, and on the seventh day he shall shave it, and on the eighth day he will bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering to make an atonement for him, for he that sinned by the dead and shall hallow his head that same day. And he shall consecrate unto the Lord all the days of his separation, and shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering. But the days that were before shall be lost, because his separation was defiled. And this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, and one ram without blemish for a peace offering. And a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their meat offering and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord, and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering, and he shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall also offer his meat offering and his drink offering, and the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall take the hair of the head of his separation and put it in the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And the priest shall take of the shoulder of the ram 
and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them in the hands of the Nazarite after the hair of his separation is shaven. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. This is holy for the priest and with the wave breast and the heave shoulder. After that, the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite who hath vowed and of his offering unto the Lord for his separation. Uh, beside that which his hand shall get according to the vow that he hath vowed, so he must do after the law of his separation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and his son, saying, On this wise shall you bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious to thee, and the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name thereby upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So we can see that there were times in ancient Israel that a man would take a vow of separation. A woman as well could do that. Uh, today, such vows are not uncommon. And the most common type of vow is a permanent monastic vow. And even those that aren't in the Catholic Church, you'll run into people who will say, well, I'm single for Jesus. And Monastic vows are taken by various religious orders in the Catholic Church and other churches. And is it acceptable to the Father to take a vow of poverty or to take a vow of celibacy? For the sake of this study, let us define monasticism, which best describes those who are taking such vows and live in monasteries, etc., Christian monasticism, and this is just a definition that I looked up, is the devotional practice of individuals who live in aesthetic or austere, uh, cloistered lives dedicated to Christian worship. Now, this began to develop in the early church, modeled upon some scriptural examples and ideals, including from the Old Testament. But they were not ever mandated as an institution in the scriptures. Uh, monasticism has come over time to be regulated by certain rules, uh, the rules of St. Basil, the rules of St. Benedict, the rule of St. Augustine, etc. In modern times, uh, the canon law of respective Christian denominations have different forms, even in evangelical Christianity of monastic li living. Now, those that are living a monastic life are known as monks or nuns. Uh, in modern parlance, we would say, we would use a gender neutral term. We would call them monastics. And the word originates from the Greek word monakos. And it's from the word manos, meaning alone. Monks did not live in monasteries initially. Instead, they started out as hermits, as the word manos might suggest. As more people took on the lives of monks living in the wilderness, they started to come together and form communities. They formed communities to further their ability to live this aesthetic, cloistered life. And thereby they call those places where they live in the institutional churches, they call them monasteries. And those who live in the community would be a cenobite, or those who live in total seclusion would be considered hermits. Now notice that the word monk means to be alone. Uh, in the very beginning, God establishes this as an aberration among men. In Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help for him. So we see in the New Testament that also that women below a certain age, in 1 Timothy 5.9, they were commanded to get married. So if you feel that God has called you to be single for Jesus, well, does that mean he called you to break one of his commandments? Uh, go read 1 Timothy 5, 9. Uh, in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, Paul talked about seducing spirits that would forbid to marry. And uh, it goes a whole lot deeper. The, the, the reasoning for it 
is this thinking that somehow you can't do the work of God if you are living in companionship. And this thinking became more prominent during the Middle Ages, along with another vow that we call the curse of the vow of poverty. Those who wanted to serve God were truly expected to take a vow of celibacy and a vow of poverty. In other words, if you're really serious about walking with God, then you'll do so all by yourself. Now, according to Genesis 2.18, that's a curse. Rather than enhancing one's service to God, it actually impedes one's service to God. In 1 Timothy 5.11, Paul warned that living without companionship, except in very few ex exceptions, would cause a person to, quote-unquote, wax wanton against Christ. I remember a lady in the second church that I pastored uh, years ago who thought she was married to Jesus. She was 32 years old, and she flatly stated that her role in the church was to be the spiritual pastor's wife. My spouse had something to say about that, let me tell you. So I sat down with her for a talk with this lady who thought she was married for Jesus, to Jesus. I pointed out that Paul forbade women under the age of 60 to live a celibate life, and she was only 32, 1 Timothy 5.9. If you are under the age of 60, you are forbidden to live a celibate life. Go read the scriptures. I further pointed out to this lady that seeing herself as married to Jesus, you know what that did? That made her my boss's wife. Now, needless to say, I refuse to acknowledge her as the self-appointed married to Jesus authority in our church just because she vowed to be single because in vowing to be single, this woman was vowing to break the commandment of God in 1 Timothy 2, 9. And so she succumbed to a Jezebel scheme and engineered a church split very shortly thereafter because she'd rather break the commandment of God in her religious attitude than to obey God's word and do things God's way. Now, is it always wrong to choose a celibate life? In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus did discuss the issue of eunuchs for the kingdom. Matthew 19, 12, Jesus said that there were some eunuchs which were born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there were some eunuchs that have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And then Jesus said, he that's able to receive it, let him receive it. Now the word eunuch, so I'm called to be a eunuch. Okay, well the word eunuch here comes from a compound word meaning to withhold from the bed, talking about sexual activity. Uh, either because of natural incapacitation and impotence or a voluntary choice. Now look, this has nothing to do with homosexuality or lesbianism as some claim they, that their same-sex attraction is what Jesus is sanctioning in that verse. That is false doctrine. There are times, although, that physiology or perhaps an accident or health issues renders someone impotent. Uh, and sometimes you have someone who makes themselves a eunuch for the kingdom. Now, that's right, I'm a eunuch for the kingdom. Well, that word there literally means to castrate yourself. So if you're a eunuch for the kingdom, then you need to go uh, find a nice sharp blade somewhere and castrate yourself. I submit to you there are very few that can receive such a saying as Jesus said. Now, Nazarites in Hebrew tradition were aesthetics, those who abstain as consecrated persons. Interestingly, they were most importantly to abstain from any product from a vine, a grapevine. Uh, interestingly enough, a vine that was left unpruned and unharvested every seven years was called a Nazarite vine. Jesus said that he was the vine. And we are the branches, John 15, 1. I am the vine, my father is the husbandman. And Jesus was also called a Nazarene. And uh, Nazarites were required to, number one, abstain from all intoxicants and products from the grapevine. They were to refrain from cutting their hair. 
They were not to come near a dead body or anything dead. Now, abstaining from wine and intoxicants. Remember that the scripture teaches these things are a shadow. It's not just talking about alcohol in the natural. Colossians 2.17 says the things we read in the Old Testament are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So there's a spiritual application as well. There may be a discussion to be had here about wine and imbibing alcohol, but remember in this case, there's an Old Testament metaphor, meaning the wine also represents something. When a Nazarite abstains from wine, Jesus speaks of this in the, in the gospel, Luke 21, and talk about it abstaining from intoxicants. Luke 21, 34, Jesus said, Take heed to yourself, lest at any time your heart be overcharged with surfeiting, gluttony, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day come on you unaware. So gluttony and drunkenness and worry are the same thing. Worry and fear is intoxicating, and if you are consecrated to God, you are to abstain from fear and worry. Some believers who would never allow themselves to drink alcohol, but they regularly imbibe in the intoxicant of worry and fear. And when we watch the network television uh, programs, the news programs, that's like going to the bar and downing a fifth of vodka because all they're pumping out, the only thing they're serving up is what? Fear, the intoxicants of fear and worry. And that's a deadly and damaging addiction, just as alcoholism or drugs. You don't have any idea what fear does to you, but you are to abstain from it. Are you consecrated to God? Oh, yes, I'm consecrated to God. Then you are to abstain from the intoxicant of fear. Because Jesus says that he ranks fear right up there with gluttony and alcoholism. Revelations 21.8 says that fear is a sin, thereby it is something. Well, I can't help but be afraid. Yes, you can. Fear is a sin, and thereby it's something you could do something about. The Nazarite was to refrain from cutting his hair. Hair is a covering. A Nazarite or a Nazarene was not to cut their hair. Samson was a Nazarite. His uncut hair was the secret of his strength. Now, what does this speak to us? Does it mean that a woman's never to cut her hair or someone who thinks uh, I'm not supposed to ever cut my hair? Not necessarily. 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen says that hair is a metaphor for the glory of God. What God is saying is you're not to put your hand to the manifestation of God's glory in your life because hair in scripture represents glory. In 1 Chronicles 13, 9 and 10, Yuza reached out to put his hand on the ark. The ark represented the glory, and he was struck dead for doing so. It's the same picture of cutting the hair, touching the glory. Use a touch the glory, and he died. We don't want to touch the glory of God in our life, even if it seems a little unstable. The glory of God's an unpredictable thing. The glory of God in your life will bring about unexpected uh, situations. And if you want to live a life... Uh, simple, without complication, you may be tempted to manage the unmanageable glory of God in your life. And it's the same thing, spiritually speaking, as cutting your hair. Not cutting your hair is not necessarily literal. It's God's way of saying, don't try to manipulate or form or fashion his glory. When you don't cut your hair, what happens? It gets in your eyes. It affects your vision. Let the glory grow and affect your vision. If you don't cut your hair, it gets a little inconvenient. Let the glory of God inconvenience you. Let the glory of God impede your perspective. Things that you thought you had all figured out, suddenly you have a new perspective when you quit uh, trying to manage the glory of God and make God fit into your way of thinking. Nazarites were also not to come near dead things. Jesus is our life. How can we find something that's dead? If you're around somebody that doesn't praise God, the scripture says the dead don't praise him. And you don't need to touch that dead person. Are you in a church that doesn't praise God? That's a dead church. Are you consecrated to God? You violate your consecration to God by being in a situation where there's no praise to him. In John 15, Jesus said, again, he's the vine. He's the Nazarite vine that cannot be pruned by the hand of man. Vines are unpredictable. 
God is the God who never planted anything in a row, and a vine demonstrates that. The life of God is in that unpredictable thing. The life of God, the blessing of God, it's not in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Listen, you can be right and be dead right. You have to choose either the life of the vine that can be unpredictable at times or dead religious principle. Your consecration to God requires fidelity to the life and deference to the life that is in the vine in your life, who is Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your word. Help us to abide in the vine. Help us to honor the Nazarite vow that is incumbent upon us as believers. In Jesus' name.